All right, if you have a Bible, we're going to open this up in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. You may want to read it from the screen this morning because I want to share with you this, this, uh, this from the Passion Translation this morning, which just paints this picture so beautifully. In 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, When I revised my itinerary, was I vacillating? Or do I make my plans with unprincipled motives, ready to flip-flop with a yes and a no in the same breath? Of course not. For as God is true to His word, my promise was not meant, was not a fickle yes when I meant no. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He is the one whom Timothy, Silas, and I have preached to you. And He has never been both a yes and a no. He has always been and always will be before us, for us, a resounding yes. For all of God's promises find their yes of fulfillment in Him. And as His yes and our amen ascend to God, we bring Him glory. What an amazing passage of Scripture. And I love how Paul kind of dives into this by saying, listen, when I had to make a change to my itinerary, was I vacillating? Was I indecisive? Did I have impure, uh, unprincipled motives? Was I like not really into it? Was I not really clear about it? Was I flip-flop, ready to say a yes one moment and a no one moment? And then he goes on to explain for you and I why he would not be a vacillating person, why he wasn't with unpure motives and why he was not a flip-flop person in his yes and in his no. And his reason for us today is life-changing. He says, the reason why I was not vacillating, the reason why I didn't flip-flop, the reason why I'm not one moment yes and another moment no is because God is not like that. He goes on to say, when God says yes, God means yes. When God says no, God means no. And because God is decisive, because God decides, if I'm going to be his follower, then I need to be a decisive person as well. You know, we were, we were celebrating last night, a great affair. I'm in Christchurch this morning, and we were celebrating last night, my mom and dad, their 50th wedding anniversary. Come on, no matter where you are, that's pretty impressive. 50 years. I didn't even know, but you get a letter from the prime minister when you're married for 50 years. It's quite impressive. And they got, you know, we, we had this amazing night. And one of the things that came out was that my mom and dad are passionate about one-liners. And one of the one-liners that just kept coming out last night was my mom always says, you win or you lose by the way you choose. You win or you lose by the way you choose. Now listen, my dad immigrated to New Zealand from Kenya and went back to high school here with a different accent, experienced tremendous rejection. My mum comes from a family of seven, so poor, they would wear bare feet to school in the middle of the winter. Her mother died when she was only 11 or 12 years old. It's not like they came into this world with all of the blessings of life heaped upon them. Yet this young couple made a decision that we're not going to be victims of circumstance. We're not going to be dismissive of our potential. But we're going to recognize that our trajectory in life is not decided by how we got here, by how adverse our circumstances today. You win or you lose by the way you choose. And I believe that God wants you and I to learn in our lives to make great and wise decisions. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 33, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We've got it resounding in the New Testament. Paul says, I wasn't yes one moment and no another moment. Yeah. Jesus himself, words in red. If you say yes, it better be a yes. If you say no, it better be a no. We need to develop in our lives the ability to make decisions. It's going to define our lives. And the Bible talks a lot about decisions. Let me, let me give you some passages. In uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 21, Elijah said uh, to all the people, how long will you falter between two opinions? 
How long are you guys going to be yes and no? Deciding one way, deciding another way. If the Lord is God, follow Him. If Baal is God, follow Him. But the people answered Him not a word. In other words, even with all of that, they're still not willing to make a decision. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for you, yourselves this day whom you will serve, with the gods of your forefathers or the gods of the Amorites. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He's saying, I've made a decision. Yeah. Revelation chapter 3, 15 and 16. I know all the things you do that you are neither hot nor cold. You're not decisive. I wish that you were one or the other. Make a decision. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of your mouth. Anybody hate lukewarm coffee? Come on, give me a little amen out there. He's saying because you're like a lukewarm long black, you're gone, buddy. You need to make a decision. Now, in our culture, we're having a lot of trouble making decisions. It is a societal and a cultural challenge. When we're looking at our society in the Western world today, we are discovering that increasingly people in our day and age are struggling to make decisions. Let me tell you why. Number one, the first reason why is because we have so many decisions to make. We have unprecedented ability to make decisions in our time than ever before. I'm not a person who naturally can tell when they're exhausted. I don't, I don't normally read that very well. Normally my wife will tell me when I need to have a holiday. I normally just feel very motivated, ready to go. I'm normally ready for bed at about 10 o'clock, but I don't normally feel like I'm ever exhausted or in need of a break. And this is how I can tell when I'm really getting to the end of myself. And I reckon there might be a few people out there who can empathize. When I'm standing in front of my wardrobe, needing to get dressed for the day, looking at a whole selection of clothes, and I realize I've been there for three or four minutes. Can anybody, can anybody, nobody out there can, nobody can relate to my psychosis. The moment that I'm struggling just to make such a easy, easy and simplistic decision, I know that something is wrong in my life. And we've just got so many decisions that we can make. We've got, we can binge watch whatever we want to watch whenever we want to watch it. We can go to a supermarket. I love that video. Any men out there with me? I hate the supermarket. It is a horrible, horrible place. If a supermarket was made for men, we would have one packet of chips, one cereal. We wouldn't have brands of bananas. We would have bananas. That would be it. It is a horrible place. I'm like walking up and down like, I have no idea. There are so many decisions that we need to make. We're making decisions like never before, even about where we're going to live or what we're going to do with our job. These used to be a lot more confined, but you can live wherever you want. You can do whatever you want. And here's a big one. Here's a huge one, a a modern revolution. You get to decide your own morality. I mean, maybe for the first time ever, people are like, well, you don't even know what you are until you have a go. You don't even know what you believe until you've sampled what you... What a terrible way to work out right and wrong in a vacuum of anybody giving you any input. But we are, we are faced with an unprecedented number of decisions, and that makes making decisions really hard. The number two is that we're more aware of others than ever before. I mean, it used to be that I was living my life. I was a, I was a youth pastor in a, a church of 500 people in Central and then West Auckland. And all I was making decisions on was basically how I could look after the 30 or 50 teenagers that were under my stewardship to look after. Now, if I'm doing the same job, I'm looking at every youth pastor everywhere in the world, m- meeting with whatever celebrity they're meeting with today, uploading their little highlights reel of their greatest moments, and I'm then trying to make decisions about what is right for me in my environment. They call it the illusion of perfection, because I can see what the life you're living, your edited, polished, luxed up, filtered, chosen version of the life you're living. It makes it incredibly hard for me to be decisive about the life that is not luxed, 
perfect, photoshopped, edited and highlighted that I'm living right now. So we don't want to commit to that relationship. We don't want to say we're all in for this environment. We don't want to make our bed in that city or town for the rest of our lives. Why? Because we're more aware than ever before the life that other people are living. And here's our third one. Is this helping anybody? We lack the skills to make decisions. If there is a big statement that I think is gonna end up being saying, and this is just John, but I reckon one day they're gonna write about millennial, millennialists, the millennialist generation that was uh, fast becoming the dominant voice in the earth today. I think they're gonna write the byline, the generation that raised themselves. Because, because what I'm noticing, what I'm noticing is that when I'm looking for advice, counsel, or to form a right opinion, when this generation is gonna go to, we're gonna go to our friends, we're gonna go to our social media, and we're gonna go to celebrities. And we're gonna look at what they say, look at what they do, and we're gonna use that as a framework for making great decisions. And because nobody has ever taught us how to make wise decisions, how to think beyond the moment, how to think beyond the decade that we're, all our friendship group is in, we lack the, decision, the skills needed to make wise decisions. For the last four years, I've helped coach a football team, a soccer team, and I know very, very little about the game, but this is what I can tell you about coaching boys to greatness. We've, well, our last season, we got promoted from the bottom league to the top league, ended higher than the top team in our club. This year, our lowest victory so far this season has been 5-1. We won yesterday 9-0. The season has gone 9-1, 6-1. 12 nil called off at half time, followed by five one. Like honestly, like victory after victory after victory. And this is what I can tell you. If you want to coach eight year old boys to perform above their age level, then this is what you do. You teach them how to move a football and you teach them how to make decisions. Because when that ball comes towards them, when that, when that team is in that situation, when they're in that goal box, what they need to know more than anything else is what decision is the best decision to make so that in the moment, they don't need to think about it. And if we are a generation that is getting to every environment and going, well, just decide for yourself and have a go and you don't know until you try, we're not gonna win in anything in life adopting to that kind of philosophy. We need to pre-decide what we're going to do when we get there if we wanna make great. It's just simple, isn't it? If it works on the sporting field, it's gonna work in life. That's just the reality. And if it doesn't work in one context, why would we ever think it would work in another? And here is number four. Number four, we have lost the value of yes and no. In our culture today, I fear that we have lost the value of yes and no. What do you mean by that, John? What I mean is that decisiveness is not a high value anymore. It used to be that people valued it. In fact, I remember when I was growing up and men's ministry was what I, I kind of like got my discipleship out of. Uh, I, I remember hearing that what women looked for in a man was strength, decisiveness, and leadership. Strength, decisiveness, and leadership. And I thought that's great because I've got ginger hair, pimples all over my face, but I can be strong, I can be decisive, and I can lead. So I got a shot at this thing. If you met my wife, you would know that it works. It works, people. <laughs> But if there is a challenge to our culture, it is that we have lost that importance, that we don't think perhaps anymore that being able to say yes, yes, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, and you don't like it when I say that. That's no longer the highest value. Where the series came from was actually that Ben Carroll, who I'm, I love dearly, was standing in a foyer one morning, and we had another series planned for this month, and Ben was standing in a foyer one morning, and he was talking to one about Arise Team leaders, about the team that this guy leads. And the Arise Team leader is, is, is young. He's only like in his early 30s. And this, 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 this leader said to Ben, he said, Ben, there is the most amazing difference between the older people on my team and the younger people. And Ben said, tell me what it is. And he said, when I, when I text out my whole team, on a Monday, and I say, are you gonna be there on the weekend? Will you be there for our team this weekend? He said, everybody over the age of 40 texts me back straight away, and they say yes or they say no. But the younger people don't even text me back. And if they do text me back at all, it'll be on a Saturday, and it'll still be, at that point, a yes or a no. 
Why is that? Why is that? The reason why is that in our culture, I'm not here to pick on young people, I'm here to define our culture. Our culture values more being agreeable than truthful. If we are witnessing a massive societal shift, it is that we would rather now lie or say nothing than offend you. And this is of great danger, and I'm gonna spend the rest of this message kind of helping you to understand why, because if there is something that we need back in our hands, if we're gonna change the course of our lives, and if we're gonna fulfill the purpose that God has for us, we need to develop again, as believers, the ability to say, I am saying yes, and I am saying no. And my yes is yes, and my no is no. Because I am not unprincipled. I am not a flip-flopper. I am not vacillating. God is yes, and God is no. And as His follower, I have a yes, and I have a no. And you may not like my yes, and you may not like my no, but you're not me, and I'm not gonna let you trump me. Because what we do is we're like, okay, okay, someone says to me, are you gonna be at this event? And we're like, well, I don't wanna offend you, or I don't wanna conflict, or I don't wanna be disagreeable, because being disagreeable is really challenging today. So it's easier to lie than it is to confront. Come on, am I talking the truth here? Now this is a great danger because we've gotta understand the difference between what you might be absorbing culturally and what is gonna allow you to become a person who fulfills the purpose of God. Because God is not interested in a group of people that will lie rather than say something that is difficult. If you've got a Bible, check this verse out. Psalm 138 verse two. This is the psalmist talking about God. For you have magnified your name, uh, your word above all your name. You have magnified your word above all your name. You have made of higher value what you say than what your, what your name is. Your, what you say you're gonna do is more valuable than what your name even is. Why is that? Because if God's word is no good, his name is no good. If your word is no good, your name is no good. If we wanna fulfill the purpose that God has got for us, guys, we're gonna have to realize that our ability to say yes and mean it, no and mean it, to follow through on our yes and our no is of importance to us because we are defining our personhood by our yes and by our no. Someone wait the person next to you and say, this is a bit tough today, this is a bit tough. I remember talking to, just the other day I was, I was preparing for the series and I was talking to a pastor friend of mine who has, in my opinion, probably one of the most exciting churches in Australasia at the moment. It's called Glow Church and his name is Joel K. And Joel, Joel, for a season of time, he got married to his beautiful wife, Alan, and then they moved from Sydney, Australia to the Carpety Coast of Wellington to be around extended family. They lived there for several years. While they were living there on the Carpety Coast, Joel was a, a, a newly uh, graduated teacher and he needed to find a job. So he started applying for jobs all over the Wellington region. Now, if you know anything about Carpety, it's about a one hour drive to the city center of Wellington and about the same to get to the Hutt Valley. He applied for jobs everywhere. There are only two high schools on the Carpety Coast. He got, given a, got offered a job at Hutt Valley High School. Hutt Valley High School is a one hour drive from the Carpety Coast. He accepted the job. The very next day, he got a phone call from the principal of Pataparuma College who offered him exactly the same job. Exactly the same job. Now, it's two minutes drive. One hour versus two minutes. So he's a young guy, he's like, what do I do? He gets on the phone to the principal of Hutt Valley High School and explains his situation. I will never forget what he told me, and I believe this is so powerful. As the principal of Hutt Valley High School said this, he said, then what does your word mean to you? What does your word mean to you? And Joel said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you told me yesterday that you were gonna do this job for me. Are you now telling me today that you will go back on the word you gave me yesterday? Joel said, I had a decision to make, and I made a decision that my word means something. 
he made for the next three years a decision to drive. If you, if, I mean, it's traffic, guys. It's hectic. It's horrible. People die on the road like it's terrible. He made a decision to make one of the most awful commutes in the world every day for three years because his word meant something to him. And this is what he said to me. He said, John, here's the thing. I didn't know what I was doing because I'd never been taught leadership. I'd grown up in a pastoral church. I didn't know anything about leadership. But for the next three years, every morning and every evening, I had an hour in a car that I could listen to tapes. I could listen to CDs. I could listen to podcasts. And I learned everything I know about leadership in a one-hour drive in and a one-hour drive back. I'm here to tell you, friends, that your word might not always be easy to commit to. That saying yes and sticking with it, saying no and sticking with it, it's not comfortable, it's not easy, it's not always convenient, but I believe with all my heart that it is the key to discovering who we are in Christ, pulling the truth of our potential out of us, and it is important for you and for me. If you believe it, say amen. Yes and no. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, this is what the Bible says. It says, again, you have heard it. This is Jesus speaking. Again, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to God. In other words, keep your word. But I tell you, do not swear at all, whether by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair black or white or black. Simply, yet your yes be no, and your yes be yes, and no, slip. let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now, let me tell you what Jesus is saying because it's going to blow your mind. Jesus is literally saying, if you are going to give your word, then especially if you make that word to God, you better keep it. You better keep your word that you make to God. That's very, very important. But let me take it to you more personally. If you're going to give your word to somebody else, then don't you leverage something higher than you to commit to it. He's saying, if you, if you want to make a commitment that you're going to be there, don't say, I swear by Jerusalem that I'm going to be there. Don't swear by the king that you're going to be there. Don't, don't give something else as a greater reason that what you're saying you're going to follow through on than just the fact that you've said yes. Because here's the thing. When you say you're going to do something, your word needs to mean something because you are the one saying something. When you say you're gonna do it, it's enough that you said you're gonna do it because your word is all that is needed to know that if you said you're gonna do it, it's going to happen. The moment you say, because I've sworn by Jerusalem, well, I'm definitely gonna do it now, you make Jerusalem more important than you. The moment you make that City, more important than you, you become smaller than who God wants you to be. Less powerful, less significant, less central. I want you to understand that what the Bible's literally saying is your yes, when you make your yes enough, when your word is something that you'll follow through on, when your decision is backed by your, your tenacity, your resolve, your determination that what I've said, I'm gonna carry through on it. That's the moment that you become an important person in the story of your life. And we need a generation again that have learned the power of saying yes. We need a generation again that has learned the power of saying no. When I say yes, it's a yes. When I say no, it's a no. In Psalm chapter 15, I teach my kids this all the time. Who may ascend the Lord's holy mountain? Who, who may dwell on the, upon the Lord's holy hill? And then it lists off all of these things until finally it gets down to verse four and it says, he who keeps his oath even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. You know that you are a person of great decision-making ability, that your yes means yes and your no means no only when it costs you something to keep your word. 
But I want to tell you, just like Joel kept his word and it led to literally God instructing him in so much because he kept his word, you will never know the power of a God-breathed life. And you'll never allow yourself to go from small to truly significant until your yes is a big fat yes and your no is a definitive no. We need a generation with a yes and a no. Guys, can I, just, can I just give you a little more? I, I gotta keep moving because I got so much sermon and I got three minutes and 24 seconds. God comes near when you make a decision. I, I want you to hear this because many people are like, man, I just don't feel like I can even make a decision. I don't feel like I can make a decision. You gotta understand, you won't until you do. The moment you make a decision, God's gonna get your back. Have you got a verse for that? Yes, I do. Joel chapter three, verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. When you make a decision, God comes near to you. When we are not willing to make a decision, God stays away from us. And all of this is building to a central point. You need to learn to make a yes and learn to make a no. You don't need Jerusalem. You don't need to swear by anything else because who you are is enough that your yes means something. You're more important in the journey of your life than Jerusalem. I'm not here to diss Jerusalem. I love Jerusalem. But I'm, what I'm saying, you get the point of the message. I'm here to say that nothing is bigger in the story of your life than you. Nothing is more important than whether you pursue and fulfill the purpose of God in your life than you. But then it's also saying that when you start making decisions, then God suddenly has access to your life. Why? Because here's the thing about your God. He will bless you. He will empower you. He will favor you. And He will heal you. But He made us with the ability to decide. And it's not until we decide that we release God to move in the situations of our lives. We decide, then God moves. Do you have a verse for that? Yes, I do have a verse for that. This is the Jesus said words in red, read Matthew 18, 18. By the way, he said exactly the same phrase in Matthew 16, 19. He said these words, whatever you bind on earth is gonna be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is gonna be loose in heaven. So this is what I say. I say over my home, no, no. That environment is not coming into this home. The moment I give a no, heaven gives a no. I give a yes over my life. And the moment I give a yes, heaven gives a yes. I'm gonna be married to you for the rest of my life, yes. The moment I give a yes, heaven empowers my yes. The moment I give a no, no. I will not give way to bitterness. I will not become resentful. I will not be filled with pride. No, 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 no. The moment I give a no, heaven empowers my no. That's why the devil doesn't want us to be decisive. Because he understands that you can fulfill the potential of your life, be central to your own destiny, that you can release the power and the presence of God when your yes is a yes and your no is a no. So the devil's gonna do everything he can to crowd out our ability to give a clear yes or no. I wanna give you three real quick and then I'm done. Here, here I'm done. Number one, the devil's gonna overwhelm you with so many things that we can't make a decision. He's just gonna fill your life with so many things that you can't make a decision. You're gonna end up feeling like one of those social climbers in a packed out foyer who's looking over the shoulder in every conversation. Can't commit to the one you're in because of the options of what you've got. You need to get blinkers on your focus. Yes to this conversation. Yes to this marriage. Yes to this job. Yes to this church. Yes to this location. I'm here until God gives me a bolt of lightning to take me somewhere else. I'm, giving, I'm eliminating some options. Number two, he's gonna fill you with fear. Fill you with fear about what hap might happen if you make a decision. That, the devil just wants you to feel so afraid that you can't say yes. How about we reverse that? How about we get so full of faith about what might happen if we say yes? The devil lives in fear and God lives in faith. Perfect love drives out all fear. If love drives it out and God is love, then God ain't fear and we need to get it out of our lives. I'm not making my decisions because I'm afraid. I'm making my decisions because I'm full of faith. Somebody say amen. 
And number three, it's, he's going to minimize the impact of a bad decision. That's what the devil's going to do. When we're gonna, when, when, if we had time to talk about that, we'd talk about Esau. But guys, I just want you to know that we need to get the ability to make some decisions. As the band in every location join me, let me give you the key. This is my only takeaway. Then come back next week to find out how. Here is my takeaway. Make a big yes that makes for a lot of easy no's. Make a big yes that leads to a lot of easy no's. Let me tell you the most smart decision that any person can ever make. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus wholeheartedly, with, with abandon, with complete dedication. Say yes to Jesus. Yes, Jesus, I love you. Yes, Jesus, I will follow you. Yes, Jesus, I will obey you. I will live my life for you. That means it's gonna be easy for me. Now I'm saying no to sin and no to compromise and no to lying and no to stealing and no to lust and no to comparison and no to greed because I got a big yes that empowered a lot of easy no's. If we want to live our life different, then let's make a decision that we're saying yes to Jesus Christ, yes to Your Word, and yes to Your principles, and yes to Your truth. If we say a big yes to Jesus, it allows us to say a lot of easy no's.